online platform, what they're doing to improve people's lives around the world, and how all of you as makers are needed and can help. Absolutely. Yana, thank you. Thank you. Thank Yana you. Yana Renda. Welcome, everybody. Uh, hard to compete with a giant mousetrap, but we're going to give it a go. So thank you for taking time out of your busy days. Um, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about engineering for global development and what that means for the maker community and how you all can contribute and how you're probably contributing already without even knowing it. So what is engineering for global development? It is the application of technology to solving humanitarian development challenges. And these are simple things that we take for granted here, for example, such as access to clean water, sanitation, access to the grid or electricity. Engineers, technical people, makers, all have a part to play in developing solutions to these challenges. So the objective for engineering for global development is to develop affordable, sustainable, accessible, and reliable solutions to these kinds of challenges. Another way to describe it is humanitarian engineering. So I'm here on behalf of Engineering for Change. Uh, we're an organization of various communities, a global community of makers, technologists, engineers, as well as societies and socially conscious companies who are dedicated to promoting these kinds of sustainable solutions. Our mission is to empower this humanitarian engineering community to serve the underserved better. So who's a part of the coalition of organizations? Currently, we have a number of organizations. The founding organizations are the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, or ASME, Engineers Without Borders USA, as well as Institute for Electronics and Electrical Engineers, or IEEE. Since our inception uh, about two years ago, we've added a whole roster of fantastic organizations. The United Engineering Foundation supporting us, along with ASCE, ASHRAE, SABI, a lot of alphabet soup, but for those of you who are in the technical world, you might be familiar with some of these folks. In addition to that, we have an online platform which we've launched to establish a forum for these kinds of conversations, to aggregate and disseminate knowledge about existing solutions for underserved communities worldwide, share lessons learned and best practices, and to advance this work. So on this platform, and I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a virtual tour of it at the end of this presentation, you can actually collaborate with individuals and organizations throughout the world to further develop solutions, as well as learn about all of the amazing discoveries and developments that are happening in this sector. Our job with this platform and with our work in general is to really advocate and advance uh, the collection of this kind of content, nurture this community, and also nurture collaboration. So I'm going to share with you a little bit of the good work that's come out of launching this platform. Some of the innovations I'm going to share today I have in person, and some of them we're going to kind of picture in our minds, if you will. So the first, and it's going to be a little rough, I'm going to try to do this, some simple tools. So in communities worldwide where there is no access to your local Home Depot, uh, and you need to make things, what's a great way to kind of take what's available, the most available resources, and develop these tools? So one of our makers, Larry Bentley, actually found a way to capture this. He used scrap parts, pipes, and other things, washers, and put together this drill press as an example, which goes well with this jig, leveraging some of these engineering principles, wedges, amazing tools, which you mount here, and you can actually Use a screw to create a platform that goes up and down. Attach drill bit here, and voila, you have a drill press. Very simple, very low cost, very effective, and very critical in places where tools are not readily available, and you need to make things. And this is exactly what we're all about, making things. So this is something that's available on Engineering for Change. As, a, as an example, there's an entire uh, tool set demonstrated. Uh, you have some pliers. You have this awesome hammer. It gives you all of the step-by-step -step instructions. And every time on one of these slides where you catch a little maker bot, on the, in this case on the top left-hand corner, that means it's also available on Instructable. So we're kind of sharing this information not only on E4C, but also through other platforms. Another technology that I want to talk to you about that's, uh, that we've uh, kind of actually featured on E4C is the concrete lathe. So lathe, the fundamental part of any machine shop, but also incredibly expensive. And this is a technology that's been around for a long time. This is not necessarily news, but it's uh, very applicable in these kinds of, again, low resource settings. So it is um, originally come out of World War I, where, well, in this case, uh, 
weapons need to be made really quickly and not enough machines were around so there was a method that was developed to actually use concrete to develop a machine to make these weapons. Now in peaceful times hopefully we're advancing this technology as a way of creating parts and necessary machinery in underserved communities. So we've developed with two of our members an entire step-by-step -step construction guide on how to make a concrete lathe. What is necessary, what kind of technology uh, you can use to actually build this. It's an open source project, which means that anybody can contribute to the betterment of this concrete lathe design. The design is available on SketchUp, and you're all welcome to, to check it out and uh, toy around with it. Another area that's fundamental and that's really critical and in need of maker influence is in the area of health devices. One of the things that we often see in underserved communities is that well-meaning organizations, companies, deliver machinery for whether it's diagnostics or actually conducting therapies that although useful in most developed world uh, areas, just doesn't function well when you have brownouts or a lack of electricity consistently, when you don't have the components that need to be replaced so you really can't maintain this kind of equipment, or where you actually just don't have the training. You, you have folks in the clinics that are not able to actually maintain and operate these systems. So one example of a, a really innovative solution comes to us from Engineering World Health, which is one of, of the groups we've worked with. And what they recognized is that, is that electrocardiograph machines, which are prevalent in every kind of health clinic throughout the world, actually have a small fault, which is the little pads, and you see this image right here, uh, the pads that attach to a person to actually capture the signal and take it to the machine uh, are generally disposable. Uh, great, easy to get here where there's a supply chain, but in underserved communities where supply chains are not that robust, these kinds of pads are not available. So they're trying to find an alternative solution. It seems like a, such a very simple piece, but it actually took some significant thought and material science to understand that the linings inside of bottle caps, so like you see here in this case, Bud Light, not tried to plug for them, but um, those caps are actually have the same material properties as the same pads. And the advantage is that they're no longer disposable in a way because you can sanitize them. You can actually just boil them and reuse them over and over again. And with the simple process that they've developed, they have a step-by-step -step process they've outlined, again, Instructables, you're welcome to see it or on our site, you can actually manufacture these easily in country with some snaps, the snaps that hold your jeans together, and one of these pads. So simple, effective, and fundamental when you're looking at healthcare. Uh, another great example is this water-powered bucket generator that comes to us from the Appropriate Infrastructure Development Group, Design Group, apologies. Um, which is essentially a um, mic micro hydro system. You, uh, create, you get a bucket, one of these buckets that you've probably seen around, you can punch some holes in it, put it into a running body of water, and there you have it. You have, with a few more things I'm, I'm leaving out, um, you're actually able to generate electricity, charge your cell phone, plug in a stereo um, or radio. It's, it's a fantastic tool that AIDG developed with the community, this was in Guatemala, in order to not only develop this design, but also to build local capacity, which is so critically important to ensuring that foreign groups don't have to be in these countries anymore, but it can actually leave behind some of these lessons, extract some lessons themselves, and advance the field of humanitarian development. Another fantastic technology that some of you who may have been around the fair earlier would have seen is uh, Kite Aerial Photography, our group at Engineers Without Borders, who was exhibiting here all weekend actually demonstrated it. It's uh, another innovative tool that they developed while they were working at a site in Cambodia building a dam to support local agriculture efforts. Uh, before the advent of Google Earth, they were unable to get a full aerial view of the work site, which is incredibly important when you're building a dam. So they actually hacked apart a remote-controlled helicopter, bought a kite, attached uh, the motors, so their servers to be able to, to tilt and yaw, and got that bad boy up there with a little human effort of running up and down the field and managed to get a perfect aerial view of the work site. Um, with some software, you can stitch the images together and actually have something even more fantastic than what Google Earth was able to provide because often rural areas such as this are just not of deep enough interest for, for these organizations. So what you see here at the bottom uh, right hand, which I think is how you guys are seeing it, or bottom left hand, the, the young gentleman that's holding the string to the kite where the cap is attached, uh, Chai, he worked on, on this project 
and he was originally the tuk tuk driver that that worked with the team but got so enthused by this work and was so impressed by this ingenuity and this collaborative effort in designing the solution that ultimately he went on to get his engineering degree in Cambodia and is still closely attached to the chapter and the project and Steve right here is also was part of the project and nodding along and to us that's that's a tremendous success story something that demonstrates the power of engineering and the power of technology and makers to, to advance this kind of work. Another great example now we're looking more into the ICT or information communication technologies for development world is uh, comes from us from BioGames. This is something that came out of a lab out of UCLA, where they start to actually apply their innovations to telepathology. So one of the things that you find, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, is a misdiagnosis of malaria. Uh, folks that are coming into clinics and you know demonstrating some classical signs of malaria, but are ultimately poorly diagnosed, whether it's lack of capacity at the clinic, uh, lack of equipment, lack of understanding of the imagery that you're getting through microscopy. And that's a significant issue because that means that the treatment that they get isn't appropriate for, for their illness. So um, the folks at UCLA developed this game as a way of crowdsourcing pathology. And what they've seen is that in these binary, binary diagnostic decisions of whether someone's affected or uninfected, non-professional gamers were actually able to get an accuracy uh, which is uh, within 1.25% of the diagnostic decisions made by trained professionals. So it's a powerful tool, a powerful way of spreading out the work, just in the same way that you have folks looking for extraterrestrials. Well, now we can apply this to our challenges here at home that are killing people. So it is really, really a tremendous achievement. Uh, some other examples from the agricultural sector in this case uh, comes to us from both the maker community, the DIY community, and also from a market-based uh, organization. So in the case of agricultural productivity, maize or corn is a fundamental staple in many regions of the developing world. How you get those kernels off, surprisingly, a lot of times, Women will sit in a circle and just pop them off manually, which is a laborious process, oftentimes inefficient, and naturally could, could benefit from a little ingenuity and a lot of maker creativity. So on the top left-hand corner, what you see here is a corn sheller that's made from cans that you can just bend in a particular way that you can run along the cob and boom, 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 boom. There you have it. All your kernels are popping off, and it's, it's a... A little tool that makes the job that much easier, but normally, unlike us where we have fancy tools in our kitchen, gadgets for picking pickles out of jars and, and coring apples and what have you not, in these underserved communities, the kind of tools are not developed because there is a lack of recognition about the market that's available there. But this, this is a great case of, of, a, of a technology that's simple and effective and goes a long way to ensuring communities' prosperity. The, it's a little hard to see, but the bottom underneath that, the market-based solution that I'm demonstrating here is it comes to us from Global Cycle Solutions, and it's a maze sheller bicycle kit. So basically, a kit that attaches to a bicycle. Again, very important technology everywhere, uh, which you can actually pedal with and push the corn cob through, and it will deshell at a really tremendous rate. Amazing, costs about $60 maximum, and if a farm collective or cooperative gets together, pools of money, they're able to purchase this, increase their productivity, and actually uh, advance their own economic status. So more examples. Another example here we have is a very fundamental one that very few people know about. Uh, in the case of the developing world, about 3 billion people cook food and heat their homes with traditional cook stoves. A lot of times these are three stone fires, three stones, you put wood in the middle, fire. All of this is done indoors and this leads to huge amounts of upper respiratory tract infections, a lot of premature deaths, primarily of women and children. It's something that has been solved in the developed world but not being addressed anywhere else as, a, as much as it should be. So uh, the Global Alliance for Clean Cooks Stoves, Clean Cook Stoves, a group that we're working with with Engineering for Change, has been advocating for improved cook stoves for a number of years. And here we demonstrate an example of an institutional cook stove. In schools throughout Africa, if you, if you visited, what you'll see is that children get their meals out of school. And although the food is cooked in a small, usually hut that's by the school, or also, also in clinics in other parts of the world, usually not ventilated. And this is two or three women that are sitting there cooking massive amounts of food. So inhaling that smoke consistently, getting all those particulates in. 
So in this case, we demonstrate a design that was brought to us by one of our makers, which is an institutional cook stove that is both efficient because it's closed in, it contains all the heat, it also uses less wood, and vents out to ensure that those particulates are not trapped and are being inhaled. So we want to demonstrate that this is a, an amazing solution and there are many more. And and makers such as yourselves have been instrumental in developing these designs. But a matter of recognizing the need is, is the hard part here, is the crux of the matter. So what we're trying to do with E4C is to share. Share these amazing success stories, share the lessons learned from the field, advance some of these solutions by inviting collaboration amongst makers. This is actually a screen capture of the new story that includes the instructions to this institutional stove construction. We also have a topical, topical pages for all these crucial areas. Water, health, sanitation, infrastructure or structures, uh, agriculture, information systems, all of these, and energy most of all, all of these are very, very important and have their own communities of practice. You have reports from the field, new developments that we want to share with anybody who's interested and in, wants to be engaged in this work to get you off to the right foot get you informed about what are the advances that are happening. Some tools, publications, and case studies that might be of value, as well as some screaming children, all of them are good, uh, that we want to share with you. In addition to that, what we've built out is our solutions library, which is basically all of these different types of solutions that exist out there. We're trying to aggregate them, bring them all together, so that when you come and you actually start to look through different solutions, you can recognize what are some of the different ways that we can approach a particular problem. Is it a drill press or is it something else? So the value of, of collecting this information and providing this rich, rich dialogue is to ensure that we can advance and go beyond what currently exists. Because without all of this being collected, well, we're kind of reinventing the wheel constantly all over. One of the things we're working on with the Solutions Library is building out an entire program to start to also evaluate and understand which of these are the best performing. We're not without faults. Engineers go through an iterative design process consistently. And in the case of appropriate solutions, these low cost accessible solutions, the same kind of process is necessary. The same kind of engineering rigor needs to be applied to ensure that what we get is absolutely the best for the users and gets the job done effectively. Um, we also have provided a learning lab where we actually advance some of the lessons kind of generalized opportunities for further education, whether it's through academic routes or online, free of charge, uh, share our design principles. And one of the features that we have added to us is a webinar series. This webinar series where we invite thought leaders in this field to share what are their experiences, what processes they followed, what are some of the failure modes that they've experienced in developing their solution. And we invite anybody from anywhere in the world to come and join the conversation, ask questions, because questions get us to solutions faster and better. So I'm opening this invitation. The next one we have is on October 18th. We're going to be talking about water sanitation and hygiene with some of the folks from the Pacific Institute. Come free of charge. Join in. Join the conversation. If you can't make it, we capture everything on YouTube so that you're able to actually access the information afterwards. So. With that, I want to invite you to join our community of solvers and makers um, to share your ideas, share things that you've seen in the field, and join us. Uh, get inspired through our storytelling, get connected to us through social media and through our platform, and get making, because making is going to make all the difference in, in this field. So I'd like to thank you. My, uh, my contact information is at the bottom of this slide, and I invite you to share any questions. Uh, you may have. If you, hopefully, I'll be able to hear you. We'll see. No promises. I, I, I guess I've answered all of them. So in that case, oh, what? Just, oh, you have one. Okay. The, uh, the name of our next venue. Oh, and sorry, our next webinar. Our next webinar is on uh, October the 18th. It's going to be online. We're we're an online platform, so we are physically physically. I am a manifestation today, but normally we are all online. Yes, yes, sir. The challenges. So uh, the way that uh, so the question was, how do we find out these problems or challenges? So uh, we have a, a pretty large community actually right now of over 11,000 members. 
So folks bring them up to us. We, we get contacted all the time with different solutions or challenges that they've experienced through their work. We also partner with a lot of organizations that are doing work on the ground. NGOs uh, share with us their stories. We also actively seek out and harvest this information. So through our network, we've managed to actually identify a lot of amazing stories. If you go on E4C News, you'll see we publish stories twice a month uh, about some of this work. Yes, sir? Sure. So, so for, uh, how do you get involved with with our organization, and how do you contribute to the solution making process? So, uh, first and foremost, I do invite you to become a member of the site. You'll receive all of our newsletters. You'll receive information about upcoming opportunities. Uh, we actually highlight which groups are are looking actively for volunteers or have op employment opportunities where you can engage in this kind of work, where you can become a humanitarian engineer. Um, that's probably the best way. Uh, we are not, just to be very clear, we're not the ones on the ground conducting this work. Uh, this was sent to me by one of our makers who is a member of E4C and wanted to share this work and wanted to provide me with some show and tell items. Um, but um, we highlight the organizations that are on the ground and that we hope you will connect with and, and do the work with. I guess in that case, I'm going to invite David up to for us to do a little conversation one more yes I didn't actually hear the one oh on our site we have over 11,000 I believe it was 11,400 something to that effect and they're international so uh, it, it really does enrich in dialogue when you have perspectives from all over the world uh, contributing to the conversation hi David I guess I guess I'm sitting okay Fine. Um, hi, my name is David, so I guess I'll tell you a little bit about myself um, before we start the conversation for those for the people who don't know me. Um, I'm a PhD student at MIT Media Lab, where my work is focused on designing prosthetic devices. Um, how do you make comfortable prosthetic devices for people who are here and for people who are in Sierra Leone, where I come from. But um, outside the lab, one of the things I do is um, we organize this innovation challenge in Sierra Leone, where we ask high school students from all over the country to think about what problems that um, they find in their communities and tell us how they will solve those problems and then we give them about 500 bucks to develop a prototype um, and we then link them up with mentors from MIT and Harvard um, for now and local community members as well in the country who and then they develop their prototypes um, and then we invite these finalists over to uh, a summer innovation camp in Sierra Leone as well. And we then go through their prototypes, uh, critique their prototypes, have them um, interact. And then at the end of the day, we have winners who we give another $1,000 during the school year to develop a product. And then figure out the way to have them um, implement their products in actuality and one of the finalists actually is here in the audience Kelvin um, and he designed his own um, so there were 300 students who applied in this competition this was the first year within six weeks and they submitted 72 project ideas and we chose eight as finalists and Kelvin's idea for example was he wanted to build a community radio station and so he made his own batteries his own generators and his own FM radio station which he used to transmit in his community um, and which he's, which serves his community. So when there's uh, some issues in the community, people come to his radio station and call and send text messages to participate. And so we have been able to see that young people um, from the ground in Sierra Leone want to make. They are excited about making. And my co listening to you, um, Yana, um, was awesome. And my question was how how do you What's the balance between having engineers from the U.S., from the American society, us interested, goodwill people who are working here? Um, what's the balance in having us go to places like Sierra Leone and Guatemala for a week, two, a month, and develop a product versus having young people within the country um, be brought up to be the ones who do the building from scratch? Absolutely. That's a, that's a, I was about to grab the microphone when I realized I had my own, <laughs> so that would have been stereo. Okay, uh, that's a, that's a fantastic question, David. I really appreciate that. One of um, the things I did mention, I feel like I could have 
told you all a lot more, but bringing coalition of these organizations means that we're actually changing that dialogue. One of our design principles behind Engineering for Change is actually advancing local innovation, indigenous innovation, really empowering local communities to, to design and develop solutions. So with these organizations, we've actually started to change the perception of foreigners entering a local context and trying to develop a solution to more also advancing some of the local communities within our own networks. So although ASME, it's the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, it's actually an international organization. IEEE is an international organization who has membership that is actually growing much faster in India and China than it is in the United States. So all of these groups, all these professional engineering groups, have reach into local communities. And by highlighting some of this work and highlighting some of these opportunities, some of the great organizations, both local and from abroad, that are doing this work, we're trying to nurture these groups into bringing students along. So we have reach into universities uh, and, and so also other institutions throughout the developing world. African academies of science that actually have mechanical engineering professors who are hungry for more examples so that they can share them with their students in the classroom. One of the things that we're building out even around the webinar series is an entire uh, dialogue of, of questions and answers inside the classroom to really nurture young people and to show them the value of making, to elevate making. Because a lot of times, actually, this kind of work is not considered advanced or, or high tech, but it's invaluable and necessary. So by bringing it to the forefront, elevating its value, we're trying to actually get young people enthusiastic all over the world about this work and about the critical needs that they can meet by going through, whether technical education or not, and engaging with the maker movement, the informal economy throughout Africa and India, it's huge. That's trapped knowledge that we are trying to release and share with, with everybody to cross-pollinate those ideas. That's really um, fantastic. And I, um, some other thing which, I mean, will lead to a question, um, but it wasn't an observation, was uh, um, Kelvin, um, when he is in Sierra Leone, he uses a soldering iron, which is just an iron that he puts in the fireplace until it's hot enough. And then he uses it to solder. And so we here he had to hack one of his systems the other day. So we gave him a digital soldering iron, right? Because oh, wow. obviously there's no fireplace around the corner. <laughs> um, and he was excited and he used it. But one thing that was inspirational was um, he had this roll of solder that was laying down next to him. Um, and there was a tiny little solder that was broken. It was like about an inch, right, or, or something. And they were laying on the table at the same side by side. And he had to do some more soldering. Instead of going for the roll, he went for the tiny little one and try. You could see he's really trying hard to not burn his hand, but also make the last use of the solder. And I am at the Media Lab where we have a lot of tools and cool resources to do everything. And I'm sure the engineers who come from the US also have those uh, resources. So how? when we're doing this co-creation, how do we, and, and, and have you thought about the culture of, look, here's the soda, soda away, and not think about the fact that the people who we're creating with, like Kelvin, has to think about every little bit of soda and what impact that affluence and resources and tools with which we start co-creation with does impact the culture of innovation that they have. That's a, such a, another great question. Actually, there's a term for it that um, Anil Gupta from uh, the Honey Bee Network in India, who's one of our collaborators, has kind of advanced, which is that notion of frugal engineering. This is exactly what we're talking about, not making waste, just using the, every single resource and being very conscious of, of what, what resources you have available to you. In fact, when you talk about MIT, I immediately think of Amy Smith. And this is one of the stories we share, something that backs up our uh, design principles around really understanding the community that you're working with. Uh, one of the things that Amy Smith does in MIT's uh, D Lab, which stands for Development Lab, it's, it's a lab that students can join and do coursework with to understand how to build solutions is she forces them, or she not forces them, she requests <laughs> for a grade uh, that they try living on $2 a day for a week, which will really force 
you to think about what it is that you're wasting, where your money is going, and what kind of circumstances you are facing when you're actually trying to get a solution. So it's 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 a it's a culture that we recognize and we're trying to address by also sharing these different lessons that have already been learned by bringing them to the forefront by by giving them a name frugal engineering by again elevating their value and bringing them into the conversation uh, also highlighting through all of our solutions in our solutions library what resources are used what materials were used and why are why why pipes why not something else well this is something that was locally available why bicycles not something else because bicycles are readily available so Thinking about that and bringing that into the consciousness of designers and young engineers is part of the process of ensuring that the kinds of products or solutions that we're bringing to bear make sense and are frugal, useful, desirable, have good design sense, but are appropriate for the context in which they are being used. Um, I just wanted to add, too, that people in the audience can participate and you can ask questions and give observations. Uh, yeah. How do we overcome the language problem? Um, so actually, uh, one of the things you mentioned is that our community is international. Um, although right now, all of our information is in English, you're absolutely correct. One of the things that we're looking to do is actually to work with our community to translate some of, some of the content that we have on our site and also to encourage the community to start to share information in their own languages wherever possible. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a hurdle that we are we're still facing. Um, if that, I hope I've answered that question. I hope that's what you meant by language barrier, maybe some other way. We can talk more about this afterwards if you like. All right. <laughs> So uh, yes, uh, the workspace area of engineering for change is actually designed to do just that. Um, I'm not suggesting we've found uh, the silver bullet in designing the best way possible. And this is where we're still evolving ourselves. We are very much a work in progress, if you will. And uh, we invite all of you to contribute to that, to that evolution. Uh, but yes, on the workspace area, the notion is that you propose a challenge. You indicate, I am in need of this, or I have a challenge with this, or something here is not working. I need the expertise of such and such community, and uh, we try to cultivate that collaboration. Having said that, um, that's not necessarily a suitable solution when you have parts of uh, the developing world which have no access to the internet. So uh, mobile phones are much more prevalent than computers, laptops with you know, Wi-Fi. So uh, one of the things that we're exploring is how can we create that accessibility, whether it's through our NGO partners or partnering with another organization that has an SMS interface that can work with our site. That's, a, again, a problem that we're tackling and trying to understand a solution to. But we're very aware of the fact that these challenges are need to be harvested and identified. And it's a, it's a process that needs to also be appropriate, sustainable, and frugal. So I think for our end, right? So. I'm from Sierra Leone. I go back to Sierra Leone all the time, but I, I live here for school. I still do not understand the problems as well as Kelvin would because he lives in Sierra Leone and thus he breeds the problem and the issues in his community that the opportunity to solve is available to him, not necessarily to me. I don't so it's it's I think it's it's obviously laudable that um we, we, we do try to have those problems from the communities be shared with us. But for me, the, 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 the question, the answer to your question really that I think about is how do we create a platform um, for Sierra Leoneans within Sierra Leone to understand the challenges and the resources and tools that are available to them to solve those, right? And it can be through co-creation. It can, it, it, that it's a different question a little bit different from how do I explain that problem and make it available to the engineer who's in Brooklyn or MIT versus how do I have the Sierra Leonean who's in Sierra Leone Freetown understand his own problem and direct into the resources for him to solve the problem that they're experiencing. Absolutely. Absolutely. I actually agree with that completely. And that's part of ensuring that global dialogue 
so that kind of perspective gets into the mix as opposed to all of us just talking to each other all the time and keeping it insular. So breaking some of those barriers and inviting that viewpoint is, is incredibly critical. Uh, well, we haven't encountered any issues of that sort, but those are very much uh, kind of unique to each project or each challenge that is being featured on E4C. And we do discuss them, and we know that you know some countries are not as welcoming as others, and there might be barriers to, uh, to entry that you know creators, designers, engineers need to be aware of and understand. And that's part of the discovery process. That's part of the design process is understanding your boundary conditions, your constraints, whether they are environmental, cultural, political, um, you name it. So um, we report on that. We highlight those, uh, those issues and how they were overcome. But uh, we are, again, we are engineering for change itself. We are a knowledge aggregator. We're a knowledge disseminator. We're a forum for bringing these connections together, for capturing the knowledge, for advancing the field and advocating for the field. But on these kind of on the ground issues are actually dealt with by the parties who are working on the ground, whether it's communities that are local or NGOs that are working with them, they so, are individuals. So for us, um, the organization we run called Global Minimum, and the website is actually gmin.org, um, which I founded with some friends out of high school. Um, we we worked we've worked in Sierra Leone now over many years, and it's actually a pretty interesting relationship between the government, the some private companies, um, and some civil society um, institutions. So the the Ministry of Education opened its doors to us so that the applications that are submitted for our competition is through them. So all the dis the different um, inspectorates of schools in every district receives the applications, and we get it from them. The National Youth Commission. Um, uses its youth volunteers to go out and tell other youth about the competition. So they are also very involved. And part of Kelvin's trip here to World Maker Fair, this is his first time living in Sierra Leone, was funded by um, a cell phone company, one of the major cell phone companies, um, AfriCell, to come here um, and be. And he's actually going to be at the D-Lab, and he's going to participate in some D-Lab classes at MIT. Um, and so there's that component. This is an example of where you have the different groups, both the government, or well, the government, the, some private institutions, and some civil um, society groups coming together. But like you said, Yana, it's about, I think um, it's about having the confidence and trust of, the, of a local institution that understands how to navigate the system well enough um, to be able to do something meaningful so that we're not just going there and saying we were here and we put a pin on the wall that says one of the other countries that we yeah. went to because uh, that defeats the purpose of, of, our exi of why we exist as organizations. Absolutely, and part of it is also storytelling, it's telling stories of the successes, talking about organizations such as yours, highlighting their good work and demonstrating their best practices that's uh, helpful. It helps, it helps to advance other groups who are looking to do something similar, like, like the African Robotics Network, where they're trying to advance robotics programs within high schools throughout Africa. It's phenomenal work. And if more people know about it, then more people will support it. And hopefully, it'll grow and nurture young makers uh, like Kelvin to, to more of them to come droves. We want more of you, not just one. How do we, sorry, can you repeat that? How do you financially self-sustain ah, for your organization? That's a, that's a great question. So part of uh, the objective of forming a coalition with all of these other major societies is to help actually pool our resources, to collaborate. Just as we advocate collaboration, we are looking to collaborate so that we support and nurture the growth of this sector. So all of the groups that you saw on that slide for the E4C coalition, actually also provide financial support where applicable. Engineers Without Borders is a more mission-oriented support, but the other groups actually do provide financial support to ensure the, the platform is working well and can, uh, can evolve. Is there like a 
what's the difference between the process of engineering and how more So Engineering for Change, we are an online platform uh, for, in terms of online presence, we're initiative, we support programming that brings together thought leaders to, to develop methodologies to evaluate solutions and other types of programs. Uh, we are not on the ground. That's the biggest difference. We are not the ones that are, are building solutions. We are working with the groups, capturing their stories, sharing their methods, starting to actually create this living library of solutions and those NGO groups that are working to develop them or individuals or larger multilateral organizations, whatever they may be. So Engineers Without Borders, on the other hand, is on the ground building building the dams or, or the bridges or the schools or the water systems. So that, that's, a, that's a major difference between our organizations. Um, I think your first question was where can you find information about these different NGOs. There are numerous platforms that exist. Uh, we're one of the ecosystem. We're one of the groups that's trying to actually share and advocate for these individual groups that are out there developing solutions. So. Um, I, I'm personally comforted by the fact that there's a lot of initiatives in this sector, that there's a lot of focus on trying to kind of bring efforts together, share resources, share ideas, and I'm, I'm personally proud to be a part of the effort to do that and advance, advance that work. Um, I think we are done with questions. Um, unfortunately, I think we... What, what's my position? My, at, at, I, I'm a senior program manager, which, quite frankly, it doesn't mean a heck of a lot to most people outside of my job, but yeah, that's my, that's my position. But um, this is my full-time job, correct, and I also volunteer part-time with Engineers Without Borders New York. I'm the president of the New York Professional Chapter, so I kind of two hats. <laughs> yeah, so I think, thank you very much um, for your um, participation. I mean, my closing statement is really, that's awesome that there are platforms and that there are people who um, want to teach, um, who want to help young um, makers, whether it's in the U.S. or in Sierra Leone, and that it's really our responsibility to empower those young people to understand that you, as I mean, many of them say it's their responsibility to uh, change their nation, their communities, absolutely. and that's through making and through hacking. Absolutely. Thank you so much. It's absolutely true. Thank you all for joining us. <laughs>